Welcome to the NHS still worth defending, question mark. This is the penultimate debate in the battle over life and death strand that's running in this room throughout the day and that's supported by the Welcome Trust. Um, for those of you who weren't at the previous debates in the strand, my name is Sandy Starr. Uh, I'm the producer of the strand and I work for the Progress Educational Trust. That's a charity that champions and explains and encourages debate about advances in genetics and assisted conception and embryo and stem cell research. Now, in the previous debate in this strand, we were discussing some of the most cutting-edge uh, developments in science and medicine that challenge them, our most fundamental ideas about how and why we seek to intervene in our biology. But now we're going to come right back down to earth, get down to brass tacks, and ask whether the UK's National Health Service is still worth defending. Uh, even those of us who are in rude health, or even those of you who are in rude health, um, encounter the NHS fairly regularly in at least one of two ways. Uh, whenever we need health care or someone close to us needs health care, um, and whenever we open a newspaper or switch on the TV, uh, the NHS was probably the most high-profile political issue in the run-up to the UK's general election earlier this year, um, and it's perfectly appropriate to debate its future at the Battle of Ideas, and we have four very distinguished speakers with different perspectives who are going to do that, uh, tell us whether the NHS is worth defending, why and how, and to what extent the NHS is or isn't even the same institution that was founded almost seven decades ago, because a lot has happened uh, in that time. So in the order in which they're going to speak, first we have Dr. Claire Gerarda on my far right, who's a general practitioner, uh, medical director of the NHS Practitioner Health Programme, and previously uh, chair of the Royal College of General Practitioners and a senior medical advisor to the UK government. Uh, then we have, on my immediate right, Dr. Frankie Anderson, uh, registrar in neurorehabilitation at the Oxford Deanery, uh, co-founder of the Sheffield Salon, which provokes, promotes uh, spirited debate and rational inquiry, um, and she has spoken at many debates about medicine and the NHS in recent years. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Christian Niemitz, on my immediate left, uh, who's a senior research fellow at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Uh, his background is in uh, economics and political economy, and he's the author of publications including uh, A Patient Approach, Putting the Consumer at the Heart of UK Healthcare, and What Are We Afraid Of? Universal Healthcare in Market-Oriented Health Systems. There's a clue there. And uh, last but not least, on my far left, we have Dr. Michael Fitzpatrick, who's a retired general practitioner and who speaks and writes on many issues, but particularly uh, autism. Uh, he's chair of the editorial board of the charity Autistica. He's written several books, including one book 15 years ago that I think is very interesting in light of development since and very relevant to today's debate. And that book is entitled The Tyranny of Health, Doctors and the Regulation of Lifestyle. Those are our speakers. They're going to speak for five minutes each. Um, we're going to find out if they come to praise the NHS or bury it. And we're going to find out, first of all, from you, Claire. I thought I heard uh, Mr Hunt the other day say to Lord Lansley, well, well, here's another fine mess you've got the NH into. Maybe I didn't really hear it. Maybe I just made it up, just like they've made up their broken promises uh, that we've had to listen to for the last five years. And talking of the last five years, the NHS... What's not to defend? The NHS is regularly rated the best in the world for efficiency, effectiveness, safety, coordination and patient-centred care. That it achieves all of that while spending less as a percentage of GDP than most other countries in the world. But actually the question misses the point. The point is the question, a point of the question is the question itself. The question should be what kind of national health service is worth defending? The NHS that should be defended, the one that I have dedicated my entire life to, is a public NHS. It was declared at the moment it was born that this nation now had the moral leadership of the world. And the NHS still remains an international bastion of efficiency and equity. But successive changes over the last few decades have opened up a gulf between the health service we think we know and the health service we now have. The NHS in 2015 is no longer national. The Secretary of State's direct democratic responsibility to provide health care to all has gone. It is no longer about health. Trusts now compete for contracts instead of cooperating with their neighbours. And it is no longer about service. Competition threatens to break up 
the integrated care that any efficient health service relies on. While the profit imperative, not the needs of the public, increasingly determines the availability of health provision. The NHS was built up over generations of born of war and strife. It helped to heal a nation. It is a democratic surface, service offering universal health care. It addresses health inequality like none other. Decades of ideological change and market policies have eroded these values and stolen the health service that the nation used to know and still loves. Cuts, the waste of the market, the self-fulfilling fallacy of choice and the ill-defined concept of efficiency have stolen life for too long. They have robbed us of our national dignity, humiliated us internationally and betrayed our responsibility to the fellow members of our society. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a con to say we can't afford the NHS. The fact is, the NHS provides what people need, not what they don't need. And we will, if, if we don't provide it, they won't stop needing it. So if the government doesn't pay for the NHS through our taxation, their need won't go away. And who will pay for it? The obvious answer that some of, is that some of us will go without the care we need and the rest of us will have to pay for it ourselves. But instead of getting the fantastically good value we get by paying through our taxation, we'll have to get it privately, either via, di either via direct payments or via insurance. And we won't have the purchasing power and the sophisticating purchasing that the NHS has now. So we'll all end up paying more for less. The government will also be able to claim that it's saving money, but individual taxpayers will be getting a far worse deal. Going forward, the NHS has to change. Of course it has to change. We're all getting fatter and older and more demanding, and the NHS will have to change to deal with the problems that we face going forward. But as a public service, funded through taxation, free at the point of use, with resources distributed according to need, not want, the NHS must be defended to our dying breath. Thank you. In the next five minutes, I plan to argue three things. First, that the NHS has changed to a point almost unrecognisable from its initial inception. That the NHS is not one homogenous organisation that we perceive it to be. And that we need to remove the emotional language and have a realistic debate about the NHS we have and the health service we want. The introduction of the Health and Social Care Act on April the 1st this year has been the biggest overhaul since the NHS began. Its introduction has followed a trajectory since the purchase of provider split under Clark in the 1990s to Millburn's development of Foundation Trust in 2010, which has increased the amount of private involvement within the public national health service. This change in legislation, which promised an end to top-down reorganisation, has resulted in a health minister who micromanages at a level beyond any seen before. Mid-Staffordshire, Morecambe Bay and other tragedies have led to recognition that there is significant variability across wards, hospitals and trusts. Indeed, the death rate in a hospital at the weekend is on average 10% higher than during the week. The care you receive if you, have, uh, if you turn up on Wednesday at noon is different from the care you receive at midnight on Sunday. Further legislation has led to the duty of candour, which requires by law a healthcare professional to apologise to patients, family and the trust if a mistake is made. In addition, the CQC inspection service has resulted in expensive and time-consuming inspections and an offset rating system that contributed to Addenbrooke's going into special measures. This has paradoxically moved us away from a blame-free culture that we need towards a more punitive method of dealing with failure. The recent negotiation of junior doctor pay, apparently done to move to seven-day working, has led to already embittered junior <coughs> doctors threatening to go on strike or leave the profession for warmer climes, or indeed McKinsey, with shape of training on the horizon threatening to radically change how doctors are trained. <coughs> we have had enough. A survey of 3,800 doctors by the British Medical Association in 2012 show that two-fifths are considering leaving the profession, with 50% saying they would not recommend a career in medicine.
This leaves us with a system that is very much changed from the one that is consistently represented in the press and other outlets as our NHS. In addition, the NHS is a victim of its own success. We are living longer with complex chronic diseases in a healthcare system that can do more and patients who are expecting more. And rightly so, age should not be a barrier to treatment. The move to empower patients and make them joint decision makers in their own preventative care will only go so far. We will still need to provide for those who make the most human of choices and put lifestyle decisions of smoking and drinking above eternal good health, or who have the unfortunate luck to be born poor. I cannot see the private providers scrambling to support the alcoholics of Doncaster. All of this is in a context of serious financial crisis. This week has shown eight out of 10 trusts in the red with the 930 million overspend in the last three months. The money is running out. We need to have a realistic debate about the NHS we have and the healthcare system we want. We need to strip away the hyperbolic language that equates any criticism of the NHS as tantamount to opening the doors to private providers. We need to recognise that the NHS does good, but could do better. And we need to look at how we provide this health care of the service in the future. Do we want a health, a health service that is consistently free at the point of demand? If so, how will we fund this? And what are we prepared to sacrifice in order to do so? So in conclusion, the NHS does need to change. Defending it blindly without criticism sells short our patients and our society. Christian, are you satisfied with these arguments? Somewhat. <laughs> And is the NHS worth defending? Well, that depends on what you want to defend it against. It depends on what alternative you have in mind. I could think of alternatives that are probably worse than the status quo. I could think of alternatives that are probably better. Seems to me that most people have somehow managed to convince themselves that the only conceivable alternative to the NHS would be to get a carbon copy of the American system. And that's why people then feel obliged to defend the NHS, because nobody wants the American system. Even the Americans don't want it. But it's, it's a completely false dichotomy. It's just nonsense to pretend that there's only these two systems in the world. The reality is that there's lots of systems to choose from. When it comes to different healthcare systems, we are practically spoiled with choices. And some of those alternative models work reasonably well. So one possible alternative is uh, the kind of public insurance system that, that you get in places like France or Australia. In those systems, most healthcare is still publicly funded, but it's not necessarily publicly provided. So the state would pay for most services, but it would buy them on an open market where you get a plurality of providers that can be public, there can be charities, there can be private companies, and you get a much larger independent sector than in this country, and you get a much higher degree of competition. Another alternative would be the social insurance model that you see in places like the Netherlands and Switzerland, where most healthcare is, well, where both funding and provision are largely private, but where the state has a role of ensuring that, firstly, everybody has access to healthcare, regardless of ability to pay. So in those systems, everybody has health insurance, even, the, even homeless people have insurance, it's never a matter of, of money. And secondly, the role of the state is to make sure that nobody is discriminated against on the basis of health status, so things like pre-existing conditions, family history, or, or whatever it is. These things uh, don't matter. You will always have uh, access to insurance at the same premium in these systems. And if you look at international uh, league tables of health outcomes, you will find that the kind of pluralistic systems that I mentioned are almost always in the top third. And that is not just cancer survival rates. That's a whole range of measures, whereas the NHS is almost always in the bottom third on those measures. Together, interestingly, with its closest relative, like, for example, the Danish system. And that's a whole range of measures confirming 
that. That's whether you look at stroke survival rates, whether you look at uh, avoidable mortality rates, whether you look at um, complications after surgery, at hospital infections, at waiting times. You can pick almost any indicator at random. You will always see this pattern that the pluralistic competitive systems that I mentioned will be close to the top, NHS will be close to the bottom uh, together with some, some of its closest relatives. And what that does suggest is that it is absolutely possible to combine the most attractive features of a public system and the most attractive features of a market system. You can combine universality and equity on the one hand with competition and consumer sovereignty and freedom of choice on the other hand. There is absolutely no contradiction between these objectives and systems like the Dutch system, does the Swiss system do illustrate that that is possible to combine those objectives. Absolutely no contradiction here. So while the NHS is lagging behind on a lot of measures, it's also worth phrasing this the other way around. What does the NHS achieve that comparable systems don't? Can you name one thing about the NHS that would impress a visitor from France or the Netherlands or, or Switzerland or any comparable country? And if you struggle to name an example, then why do you think the NHS needs defending? Thank you. Mike, I gather this isn't the first time you've discussed the NHS at a public debate. <laughs> no. no, it's not, Sandy, indeed. And I think one of the problems about when we're discussing the NHS, the National Health Service, is there's a sort of assumption that that the, the middle term in that uh, name, the health, that, we, we, that it has some sort of fixed meaning and that we're all talking about the same thing and it's the same thing that's always existed and we're talking about how best to, to provide it. Uh, comprehensive, national, different forms of uh, provision, public, uh, voluntary, private, social health insurance, all the rest of it. But the concept, what I'd like to just interrogate a bit for this purpose is, is the concept of health that we're talking about. What is the content of this concept? Because I think the idea that, it's, that it has some fixed meaning is highly problematic. I was really, this really forcefully brought home to me the other night, and I watched this. The BBC has got this fascinating archive of old uh, television broadcasts about the NHS. And you can look, at, look into it, and you can see an Aaron Bevan's an announcement of the NHS. You can see beverage. You can see debates on the NHS in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. There's a fascinating panorama episode in 1968. Uh, a programme made by James Burke. And it's the 20th anniversary of the NHS is commemorated in a panorama discussion about the NHS. And would you believe it, the NHS on its 20th anniversary was on the verge of collapse. It was on the verge of disintegration. GPs were, were emigrating on a vast scale. They were overwhelmed with work and experiencing great traumas. The hospitals were on the verge of collapse. Everything was in a state of complete chaos. And... Uh, so, you know, same old, uh, nothing new there. What was fascinating about the programme was the, the sort of solutions that were being put forward. And there's a whole range of highly technocratic, appropriate to the white heat of the technological revolution of the 1960s, various technological, uh, technocratic solutions were put forward. We should have more pro expert professional administration instead of all these lay uh, representatives on all these hospital management committees. We should have computerisation. There was an absolutely brilliant little, uh, little episode in this where some uh, enthusiast was displaying in a hospital ward somewhere in King's College Hospital in London the first hospital, uh, the first computer being used in the hospital. He said, very soon, all patients' records will be on the computer. <laughs> I brought my 97-year-old mother to hospital last week, and they're still wheeling around notes in wheelbarrows in hospital. So you, Christian may make the, you know, the NHS, if this is the best in the world, you know, uh, we can, uh, we, we ought to be able to do a bit better than that. The, some of the other, then went into some more, more general uh, grand schemes about what could be done. Population planning, voluntary euthanasia should be introduced for the incompetent and unproductive elderly. 1968, this discussion. Compulsory con contraception for adolescents. All adolescents at the age of 12 or 13, all girls should be injected with a contraceptive and would only be, uh, would be sort of stop the contraceptive when they satisfied some committee that they were suitable to reproduce. <laughs> 1968. 
Sounds great, Mike. <laughs> the most interesting recommendation that came out of it, for me, and, and, and it relevant to the current discussion, is that they recommended that the, the National Health, so the Ministry of Health, should be renamed the Ministry of Health and Wellbeing. And the concept with that was to expect that psychiatric services should be expanded on a much wider scale so that they could adjust what they described as the unhappy and ineffectual behaviour of a lot of citizens in society to bring them up to date with the uh, developments of, of British society and the National Health Service. And of course, the Ministry of the National Health Service and what the coupling of health and well-being, of course, has entirely come to pass uh, in, the, in, the, in modern society. And this is the fundamental transformation that is taking place. See, in 1948, when people talked about health, Health was understood as a default status. Health was what you were. Healthy was what you were if you weren't ill. And if you were ill, you went to a doctor, he either signed you off work for a while, gave you some treatment, you went back to work. End of story. That was what health was all about. Today, health and well-being has been inflated into the transcendent goal of the whole of human life, partly to compensate for the removal of traditional transcendent goals that people used to, people used to live their lives in the idea they might go to heaven. Some people live their lives in the idea they might be able to bring heaven about on earth. All, people had all sorts of ideas about what was important in life. Now the goal of health and well-being has become for many people, and indeed for, for society as a whole, the biggest uh, and most uh, important goal. And of course, as a transcendent goal, it is something which is never achieved but as con must constantly be striven for. And we know how our lives increasingly are dedicated to, with a degree of asceticism and fervour to achieve the goal of perfect health and well-being. Diet and we all know the endless injunctions about diet and exercise on the one hand and all the uh, anxieties around uh, 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 the damaging uh, lifestyle activities like alcohol and smoking on the other. And the, just as fitness has been uh, manifested the extreme uh, virtue of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, the new form of morality, so these other activities are shameful and stigmatised evil uh, smokers and uh, fat people are to be shunned and uh, uh, treated as somewhat less than full citizens. And everybody then is expected not only to dedicate their lives to this project, but also to engage in a constant process of self-monitoring. Satirised very well in Bridget Jones' diary, even 20, almost 20 years ago. But, you know, that's now. People have all got these apps now that where you can constantly monitor your heart rate and all that if you go on a walk and how many steps you've taken. I'm sure lots of people here have got these wristbands. I think they can check in with their computer about their current state of their health so you can monitor your health on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with the benefit of uh, global positioning, the satellites and all the rest of it. That is your individual responsibility in modern society is to maintain a constant monitoring and surveillance over your health. Also, that just doesn't, is not the extent of your responsibility. You have also got to submit yourself on a regular basis to the surveillance of the medical profession. You've got to have regular checkups. You've got to submit yourself to screening tests of all sorts. And that is the whole project of your life uh, increasingly in modern society. Wellness is the supreme virtue. If you're ill, it's your fault. That's the... I bumped into a neighbour of mine the other day. And if she's a woman in her early 50s. She's just had a stroke. I said, how are you, how are you? Sorry, I've got to get moving out. I won't tell you that anecdote. But, you know, <laughs> just the, the sense of bitterness. You know, why did I get a stroke when I, when I follow all these healthy living principles? You know, that sort of bitterness that people experience. So the wellness syndrome is the pathology of modern society. You know, the, and, and the, the point that's really important to get at is the wellness syndrome is making people ill on a cosmic scale. And... People are tired all the time. They go to their GP. Not surprising they're tired all the time if you're uh, devoting your life to that. People are consumed with anxiety and self-blame and guilt over their failure to meet the standards that are set for them. If so, they can be provided with cognitive behavioural therapy or even better, mindfulness therapy is the most happening form of therapeutic intervention in that life. So we see, where does the NHS fit into this? The NHS is at the, the sort of centre of a dialectic of narcissism, a, a spiral in which... There's individual, there's the individual cultivating the body as the ultimate object of their existence and a society for which health is the supreme uh, goal that's to be achieved. This is amplified by politicians. You know, the, every election campaign... Sorry, 
I, I can't give you too many examples, but you, you get the general. So it has reached a sort of almost a level of almost psychotic intensity, this preoccupation with this inflated concept of health. And the point is that if you inflate the concept of health to that degree, it is, creates an unsustainable level of demand for any conceivable form of health service. So is the NHS worth defending not to do that kind of job, in my, in my view? Uh, there's lots I'd like to ask the speakers, but it's a shorter session, so I'll get you to chip in first. Um, my name's Leslie Kerwin, and uh, uh, I work mostly for the BBC. Um, I would have been on Claire Gerrard's side until recently, but I've watched my sister's treatment um, and the failures of that treatment at a hospital which is not a cancer centre of excellence. And now I have to say that I'm beginning to be attracted to Christian Nemitz's argument that there are other ways of providing the services that we need. But I wanted to ask you, what is it about the Swiss and the other systems that makes the cancer survival rates better? How you make sure the government that the competition, if they're changing NHS, the competition wouldn't be monopoly? Because we're seeing the markets, they're taken by big corporations, and two corporations agree the minimal price, it will be no possible for the even better medications to come in the market. Jonathan Kitson, why is it if the NHS is the envy of the world, are there so many stories of failure? I've ha I have a chronic condition, and um, unfortunately I have to say that I've had a lifetime of care because some of it has just been so poor. Why is it that the NHS is the envy of the world? And Christian, what, what is it, again, that other countries get right that the NHS simply doesn't for so many people? Right. Um, I'll let the panel answer now. Pressure put on both sides there. Dispute over cancer survival rates and whether they're better. And I should point out, Christian had a challenge at the end of his introduction. You know, what does the NHS achieve? What can you be proud of that other systems don't, etc.? Claire, step in. I mean, it, it just lies, damn lies and lies. The cancer issue is very complicated. It depends where you start the count, whether you start it with screening or whether you start a five-year survival, i.e. at the same point. So it's very complicated. And it's actually not that we are the worst. There are certain... Well, picking up what it is that the NHS is proud. We have a universal health record. Every single person in this country has a record. It's not the same in other countries. So some people don't get counted. We count everybody, warts and all, so that's the first thing. The other thing is, what does this country in the NHS do? I could give you a list so long, but let me start with my own general practice. The NHS was the envy of the world for its universal health service, but more point for its system of delivery by having comprehensive, coordinated care delivered through the likes of me. Now we're disintegrating. We're, we're, we've got five years left, I'm afraid. General practice is going. Having the medical home based with the GP was what other countries envied us about. In terms of all other things, I mean, I can go on and on. Our form of public health, our form of uh, uh, planning across populations rather than piecemeal, so all sorts of things. Of course we can learn from other countries. Nobody's not doubting that. But let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. The Commonwealth Fund, on twice successive times, have rated the NHS the best out of the uh, first world countries' health service. That's an independent American system, not my wishy-washy, wishful thinking. OK. Um, Christian, you were asked, uh, conversely, what these other systems have. Um, and also, there's quite a lot Claire is proud of to answer your original question. Yes, well, you need to have a look at what, uh, the, what the Commonwealth Fund study actually ranks. That is not a study of health outcomes. That is a study which mostly looks at inputs and procedures. So this is mostly a box-ticking exercise, and it just so happens that the way in which the NHS delivers healthcare, that is pretty much the way the Commonwealth Fund thinks healthcare should be delivered. That's why it's number one. But outcomes are just one category in uh, and, and fairly, um, a fairly well, unimportant category in this whole ranking. And, but in that outcome category on its own, the NHS is once again second to last. It just cancels that out by being superb in all these other categories. But in the outcome category, the NHS is second to last, even in the Commonwealth Fund study. And the Guardian uh, unwittingly summarized that contradiction when they covered the Commonwealth Fund study. They said the NHS is doing superbly across virtually every category. It is just not good at keeping people alive. 
That was the Guardian's uh, well, it summary. Alive very long. Now, what, 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 is, what is it about the other systems that makes them better? Well, I can't go into specific conditions. I can't talk about uh, cancer, stroke, or whatever it is. But generally speaking, um, competition is not just a spur for providers. It also means you get a trial and error process, which you don't have in a nationalized system. Or, well, you can, to a degree, sometimes they do these pilot projects, but that is a bit of an, of an artificial roundabout way of doing something that a competitive system does all the time. And that's wh why, generally speaking, market economies are superior to planned economies, because they have this trial and error process going on all the time. We, we don't know from the outset what works and what doesn't work. We have to try several approaches and find out, and that is what you can do in a competitive system. Go on, Frankie. They can't both be right, can they? Um, well, I'm actually, well, I'm actually going to go back to Mike's point if I can. No, please. Um, um, I have a certain warmth for the concept that if you ignore illness, it sort of disappears. Um, that would make my life a lot easier. Um, but I, I do agree that there has been a massive conflation of, of medicalisation of normality. So I think particularly in mental health services, there's been a far wider definition of what it is to be depressed or to anxious, while there's also been a, um, a more aggressive uh, role of cutting... Um, cutting acute adult mental health beds. So there's, there's been this sort of paradox that we, everyone is mentally ill, but actually, if you need the support, it may not be there. But the point is, is, is that even if you, my point to Mike would be that even if you say to people, you know, step away from the narcissism, step away from the obsession about health, people will still get ill. People will still be unwell. You still need to provide a healthcare service. So I don't, I don't think masses and masses and masses of our funding is going into just narcissism. At some point, you will need a healthcare service, and I'd like to see what you think it should be like. Go ahead. Can I just come back to? Yes. Because I think the, the two people in the audience asked specific questions which haven't been answered. And I think Please they're in time. Because I think it's very Leslie Kerwin and Jonathan. Uh, Kitson specifically made the point about their personal experience of poor standards of care in the NHS. And I think this is a very interesting point because people involved in these campaigns, save our NHS, keep it public and organise these demonstrations, never ask themselves, why is it that there isn't a mass of former patients on these demonstrations? You know, the, the, the people who have uh, who, who overwhelmingly on those demonstrations are people who work in the National Health Service and actually overwhelmingly people in relatively well higher up the, the, the food chain in the NHS, particularly doctors. Because who's benefited most from the NHS over its years of existence is, above all, the medical profession, which voted, we should recall, by 85% against its introduction. Right, The medical profession has benefited from it. And the middle classes, in general, have done relatively, as they have out of the welfare state altogether, relatively well. I had an experience nearly 40 years ago in campaigning to defend the NHS. I remember it vividly. There was one of the early round of hospital closures in the late 1970s. I was a junior hospital doctor. St. Leonard's Hospital in Hackney was threatened with closure. And we were out one Saturday morning campaigning, getting signatures, you know, the usual thing. And a, a young lad came up to me and he said, look at the, he pulled his shirt up, and he got a scar from his ziffy sternum to his pubic symphysis, the, the entire length of his abdomen. He said, that's what they did to take my appendix out in that hospital. The sooner they close it down, the better. <laughs> so, you know, we've got to... Take account of, and I think Christian's got so many very sound points here, that the people who have this sentimental, inflated idea of the, the great virtues of the NHS simply do not know what about health service elsewhere in Europe, where the, 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 there's a, the whole sentimental cult of the NHS, assiduously fostered by the British Labour Party over the last uh, half century, has accustomed people to low standards and low expectations in the National Health Service, and we seriously need to challenge that. And to conclude on Frankie's question, I think what we, you know, people used to say, we've got a, we, we've got a national health, we, it's really a national sickness service, and we should have a national health service. What we should have is a national sickness service, and constantly, instead of treating health as a recreational activity for people who are essentially well, we should concentrate on, indeed, treating people who are, who are ill with significant diseases, the, concentrate on the diagnosis and treatment of disease and leave the rest of it for the gym. Um, Michael, I enjoyed, is this one? I enjoyed your introductory talk. I'm really curious about why you think health screening is, is not a good idea. 
Thank you. How much money would it cost until the NHS was good enough? And would it affect our tax? Christian, if the NHS is failing so badly, as it arguably is, shouldn't that mean it requires more public funding rather than a justification for placing the lives of vulnerable people in the hands of those who would profit off them? Is not the opposition to sort of the reform of the NHS kind of come down to trust more than it does to um, it, whether the outcomes will be better for people, as in people don't trust our government enough that they will bring in reforms that will have pr protections built into them whereby um, the service will be protected. And it comes down to the fact that you know, there's cases of, of party donors who are from healthcare companies who are campaigning for sort of greater privatisation. So it's about an element of trust in our actual government rather than sort of the logical arguments. So for Christian, you mentioned that the NHS has a lack of competitive system, which for all its flaws, I don't particularly think it's the case because on a medical degree, clinicians go through a lot of comp competition to become who they are. So I would just like to inquire if you can further um, develop your debate. And also for Michael, I mean, it's also an argument for clinicians. The NHS has a lot of problems, but the clinicians don't particularly lead a happy life where they benefit from the system. They work a lot of hours, they don't get particularly paid that well compared to other systems, and they're bashed day and night on, on the fact that they don't save lives. But how could a human save another human's life if they're borderline exhausted all the time? Thank you. In terms of my experience, I also have a chronic disease, and in terms of the NHS, I can only praise it. I don't think all cases are bad cases. I, I think people focus a lot on the bad situations, but people don't, normally don't bring up when good things happen. And of course, the NHS is not perfect. And I think, like Liv said, there's a lot of uh, problems with the, the doctors and the nurses. I think the work is very, um, it can be very hard on them. And there might be systems that are better, but how can we implement those in a way that doesn't bring so much private, private uh, companies into mm -hmm. the NHS, but rather bring the good things and implement them inside what we already have. I'll come back to the panel. What's Mike got against screening? How much money would it take to fix these problems? How would it affect our tax? A clinician's life is not a happy one, um, and so on. Frankie. I'll start with the, the first point. I think the clinician, uh, sorry, the last point, made, the clinician's life not being a happy one. Um, I think we come from a generation of junior doctors who have a very different approach to the NHS, actually. I think the introduction of the European Working Time Directive, which means that doctors only work 48 hours, is, is a good thing in a sense, but it's also led to massive changes within the way doctors work. So they no longer work as part of groups, but they often work a fragmented shift system. The anger over junior doctor pay is only the tip of the surface, really, for a large proportion of doctors who are fed up of, um, from working hours that they're not being paid for, but also in a system that it feels like it's falling apart. So I would say a clinician's lot is not a happy one, um, even if Mike feels that the NHS is primarily produced in order to serve our purpose. Um, the second point that I'd like to raise is really is, is kind of, is not so much from the audience, but is why the UK and England have such an emotional attachment to the NHS as a whole. Um, in, in studies done, the NHS consistently ranks high um, in terms of public perception above kind of the army. In a poll done in 2012, it came um, above the army, it came above the Olympics. So there is an emotional attachment. And actually, if you look at the terms used in newspapers or in, in, in um, discussions on the matter, there's a kind of visceral attachment to it. And also in terms of our politicians as well, Cameron before the 2012, 10 election, which um, led on to the Health and Social Care Act, made a mantra of the NHS is safe in our hands. So there is some sort of emotional attachment we have to the NHS. And I wonder what that, ref what that reflects about our politics and also about what, how we are as a nationhood. Christian, you can, you can pick up on that because clearly the emotional attachment is somewhat exasperating to you. Uh, you were also, it was put to you from the audience that there is actually a lot of competition uh, in the health system. It's just not of the sort that you recognise. Uh, no, there, there is clearly more competition than there used to be. I quite approve of the labour reforms of the mid-2000, where they introduced a system where, firstly, patients have a greater degree of choice, and also where the funding par at least partly follows patients. That has stimulated some competition within 
the NHS. And to the degree that it has done that, it has actually improved outcomes. So there are papers that have uh, looked at whether differences in quality and outcomes between hospital trusts have an impact on their market share, the number of patients they attract. And they found that actually, yes, some people do bypass a local hospital if it is no good and go to a better one. The argument before was that choice doesn't work in healthcare because people cannot evaluate the quality of providers. And well, Presumably, the number of people who download mortality figures of, of hospital trusts is minuscule, but that doesn't mean that, um, that quality doesn't matter. You, you, you only need a few people who do look into these details. If those people can then affect, affect the reputation, then um, information can also be transmitted in other ways. And you don't need a lot of people shifting from a poor hospital to a better one to for competition to have some effect. In, in a lot of markets, switching rates aren't particularly high, but nonetheless, there is competition for the few people who do switch. Now, the problem is uh, that where that hasn't gone far enough is simply that if you ask people, there are surveys, patient surveys, where they're asked, have you been offered a choice at the point of referral? And about half of, of, of the people say, no, I, I wasn't aware of this. Really? I get to choose? Nobody told me that. So wh what happens is, even though doctors are meant to tell patients, you can choose, you can go to any, any willing provider, a lot of them just don't do it. They continue referring people as they see fit. And that's why I would just abolish the concept of the referral as a whole. I think that should be that should work like a prescription, which is simply a voucher for uh, a particular medication. The doctor doesn't tell you you have to go to this pharmacy to get your medicine. They just give you a prescription and you can cash it in anywhere. And why shouldn't referrals to specialists or hospitals work in the same way? That is simply an entry ticket and it's completely up to you where you want to go and where you want to use it. Claire, I take it this isn't your vision of the NHS? Oh, well, I mean, it's nonsense, isn't it? Because on the whole, people don't have a well-defined, you know, it's all very well if we're all middle class with, say, for example, a hernia, it's absolutely fine to, to equate it. But that wasn't the point I wanted to get. It was really the point that Christian said about markets and the private sector being trusted and trustworthy and the public sector being not. Have you conveniently forgotten we're just hitting the biggest scandal with cars, with VW? Isn't VW a private, uh, a private market? Uh, have you seen uh, excuse me, okay. I'm just, I haven't finished. And the other, thing is, uh, the other thing is, the biggest market we have in the universe, the biggest health market in the world, which has been in operation, I think, for about 70 years, has the worst health outcomes, double the cost that we spend uh, in our national health service, and actually has the worst service that you can get. And regularly, even though you're now saying the Commonwealth Fund is rubbish, regularly scores the worst on every single outcome, and that's the US. So we do have examples of markets, and we have examples of markets that fail. The young lad asked about what is good enough. What makes me really sad, really, really sad, is that at his age, he's now assuming that the NHS is a failing system, rather than the successful system we have, that when we've all started off by saying we're all living longer. If it was such a rubbish system, we'd all be dying younger. But we're not. We're living longer. So you have to look at face validity. The NHS is being starved of money. Its, GDP, its share of GDP has now fallen below the G7, all of them except for Italy. So you ask me how much more. We need to spend money on health because spending money on health generates wealth because it generates jobs, it keeps people at work. Now, if you ask me how much, then I think we should be at the average of Europe, between 12 and 13% of our GDP. At the moment, we're between 7 and 8%, and at the moment, for general practice, we're only getting 6% of that share. So if we want a better health service, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we're going to have to pay for it. But the system that we have, the organisational system we have, with universal coverage, with registered lists, with a medical home, with not a free market around going to anywhere for anything, is what keeps the NHS fair. And I dispute you saying it's only the middle class. The last time I looked, we had, did have the lowest rates of drug-related deaths. We had fantastic outcomes for other issues around public health. But we have to put some money in now. 
If we continue to do it, it will be a self-fulfilling prophecy and Christian argument when we come back next year, you'll all agree with him because we're building a system that's going to fail because we're not putting money in it and then it can be sold off just like the railways. You can pick up on that quickly, Mike. <laughs> you, you can pick up on that quickly and say what, you, what, if anything, you've got against screening as well. Well... Just on the first, on, on um, uh, Claire's point, I think it seems to me preposterous the idea that the NHS should be judged on the increasing life expectancy of the population. The NHS makes a relatively small contribution to that because it's, you know, obviously the va vast number of other factors that influence it. And anyway, that doesn't seem to me to be a very useful objective to have everybody in itself just living a longer life. What matters is the quality of life that people are able to enjoy. And, you know, setting the, 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 this whole thing of swapping around arbitrary time, I mean, I agree with Claire to some extent about some of uh, Christian's points on the, the value of the statistics which are used to make these quantitative judgments. But the whole concept of trying to judge the performance of the NHS according to these uh, setting these objective targets seems to me to be preposterous. It just doesn't uh, help to do anything. It's rather like in the election campaign. You know, one political party says we're going to have... Uh, everybody can get an appointment with a GP within 48 hours. And they said, oh, my God, uh, we have to have... Everybody can get an appointment for if they're worried about cancer within two weeks or one week or something. I can't even remember which party put which thing forward. It doesn't really matter because it doesn't make any difference to anything that, uh, or to any... Uh, uh, it doesn't contribute to anybody's... Uh, health or, or even the well-being, uh, other than actually to make them their well-being worse, because in fact, to the extent that they don't achieve those targets, people will feel aggrieved, even though achieving them would not have made them any better in the first place. This is the this, this, the absurdity of these these sort of discussions. It seems to me, screening. You see, it's a very alluring prospect. If you could only diagnose everything early, then you'd have a better outcome. And it's the, the, the logic almost is if you went and lived in an MRI scanner, you'd, you know, you'd never have anything to worry about. The problem with it is, is that, that the, every, screening, every screening test has a, a rate of false, both false positives, in other words, where it, diagn or it suggests the presence of a disease which actually isn't there, which has potentially very serious consequences for the person, and it also has a rate of diagnosis of false negative, where it actually misses the disease when it is there. And according to the proportion of those things, you, you have to judge whether it's likely to do harm or good. And in fact, there's very considerable controversy about many of the screening tests which are in common usage about whether on balance they do harm or good. For example, mammography, prostate screening, uh, uh, prostate-specific antigen screening, which is, is not approved by the national screening body, but it is widely done in practice. The, there's a very strong case to be made that these things do more harm than good. And the wider culture that it generates, you know, you only have to walk out on a weekend. In every park in the country, there's people walking the streets, running half marathons, dressed in pink, walking all night, dressed in pink, promoting awareness of cancer. Every year, there's a great thing of it. Every year, so when I was working as a GP, you'd get younger and younger girls coming in whose risk of breast cancer was lower than being run over by a bus doing some of these activities who would be fearful of, of, uh, of breast cancer. So it generates... Anxiety on an enormous scale, this sort of disease of awareness of, of not just cancer, of every other disease, which is also uh, promoted, you know, uh, through the media and the, 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 the proliferation of health related websites and news things, everything else. Sorry. No, that's fine. Hello, it's Jenny Cunningham. You could see from the clapping that everybody is emotionally attached to the NHS. There's no doubt about that. And we can talk systems until we're blue in the face. I do hope, though, that people take Mike's points to heart because this is much more fruitful to discuss the whole issue of what's defined as health. Mm. It's m that should be our starting point because you can talk systems and everything else. I mean, I, I'm in the NHS. In, in my department alone, community pediatrics, I've ha in the past 10 years, I've had 12 changes of management, all trying to do something great with the system, et cetera, et cetera. But let me give you one example from Scotland, and I'll try and be as quick as possible. Mike's absolutely right. It's about well-being. But linked also to the obesity and the smoking and everything else, there's also the child protection. 
that's become a really defining point about well-being. So the Scottish Government have introduced this idea of having a guardian for every child in Scotland. Every child, universally, right? And they're not worried actually about the health of children per se. What they're worried about is well-being. And the whole service is being rewritten around this idea of well-being. Shinari indicators. Safe, healthy, active, nurtured. Um, I've forgotten what the A stands for. <laughs> Uh, respected, um, et cetera, et cetera. Included is the last one, anyway, right? We are all assessing children on this basis now, and they are appointing 500 health visitors in Scotland to do this job of ensuring the well-being of children. And in the meantime, the budget for actual health care in community <coughs> child health and public health and everything else is being... <coughs> downgraded. So the discussion is about well-being, is about health. Actually, we need to be in there and, and thinking about that. I feel that the NHS does lead to a dictatorship of public health. And the reason I say that is that Hayek famously said, freedom comes with responsibility. You can't have one without the other. Since the NHS removes responsibility in looking after, your, for, in looking after yourself, it is logical that the, the the NHS leads to a reduction in freedom. And this isn't a mad conspiracy. You ask why we're waging war on alcohol or cigarettes or any kind of other um, thing that is seen to be bad. Uh, Dr. Fitzpatrick made, raised this earlier. And the primary argument all these politicians are using is, well, we've got to save the NHS. We've got to save the NHS money. And that's why I think we need to be a bit concerned about socialised medicine. Firstly, I completely agree with everything Dr. Garada said. I think children are growing up thinking that the NHS is a failing system, when actually it isn't. I see it as something Britain should be immensely proud of and probably our greatest asset as a country. And surely children growing up in this idea that the NHS is failing is just going to make children not want to become doctors, which we so greatly need. And surely if we unified, poured all our resources, all our money into the NHS, then in the long term we'd have a far, far greater system. And, of course, Osborne's like, brutal cuts aren't helping. OK. So. Um, one of your colleagues? I find it almost laughable that uh, you're asking for more money in the NHS. We just promised you 10 billion and it's not enough. And you're the world's third largest employer behind the Chinese and Indian armies, which seems also to be insane. But I don't understand why in this country we're so afraid of the word private. For me, private means competition. For me, private means improved efficiency. Uh, for me, it means greater choice, more access. Uh, I have no problem with private companies working for the NHS in an Australian style model um, where the government pays for it, but the private companies. Do it. I think we've kind of all forgotten that state-run monopolies are inefficient, Cheaper. and we clearly need greater efficiency. Cheaper. Okay, okay. If you want to spend 20% of your health service pound on the transaction costs, that's fine. Markets cost money in that's transaction it. costs, so they're cheaper. Okay. And that's what we're finding. Vast tranches of money spent on legal costs, redundancy costs, appeal costs, advertising costs, tendering costs. We're losing money. When I grew up, when I started Claire. medicine... Sorry. But, it, but it's important. Right. Hop across the aisle. I know it's important, but the more you talk, the more hands go up. Right, uh, <laughs> this side. But we need to know the facts. We're being fed by the, the, the media, the red-top media, and they're lying. I lived in France, and it was so confusing for me, as a foreigner, to get health care. You had to wait for a carte vitale, which never arrived in the nine months that I lived there. You then, if I needed to go to the ear doctor, I had to go through the other doctor first. Even I couldn't go direct to him. Then you pay twice and then eventually a month down the line 70 percent is refunded so obviously every system has its flaws but i just want to ask if this you know devolving into private or public yeah. or somebody regulating this and someone funding this is it actually going to make it more efficient both in terms of time and in terms of cost yeah. because it was easier for me to go back to england to go to my gp uh, Ed Moriarty, do you think it's uh, fair to uh, deliberately mislead people by conflating the idea that people are admitted to hospitals on weekends uh, Point. Uh, have, a, uh, have a lower mortality rate rather than the fact that it's over the course of 30 days when they're admitted. Michael talked about the Panorama program in 1968. Uh, the NHS has obviously been very slow at getting computerised records, but it's been very quick uh, to get layers and layers of administration in. 
Uh, so the, the levels of management seem to me to be huge now. I wonder if uh, that sort of reflects on the cost of the NHS. My friends were supposed to come with me today, but they're junior doctors and they're protesting. And there's a good quote from the chair of the Conservative Health, Dr. Paul Charleston, who says, I think charging is a good idea in principle, but would be political suicide for a party to introduce us. They could only really do it if there was a feeling in the country that the health services are falling apart. And that is what they're doing now. Yep. We're losing the argument. We don't have the choice anymore. It's happening. 80% of funds this winter are going to miss their targets. Um, I'm just interested in some of your thoughts on the misalignment of incentives in regards profit-seeking versus healthcare. Because as far as I see it, I don't really want profit-seeking mo motives near my healthcare. I don't really want companies' profits to be at the front of their mind. I want my healthcare, to be quite honest. I'll sum up. Profits are now determining your health care. Every single trust now is to trying to set what they're going to deliver according to what can make money. I promise you this. And if you're not seeing it, open your eyes. Markets will deliver less for more. And as for choice, choice is wasteful. Even if we, when we're sick... When I lay on Waterloo, on Blackfriars Bridge, with a broken leg, with an ambulance, they didn't say to me, which hospital do you want to go to, ma'am? Did they? Ridiculous. Of course you can have choice. We do have choice. And it is, and I agree with the chap who said we shouldn't be reduced to this splitting one or the other. Because actually some places, the market and private sector does add value. But it's where it does add value, not this ideological nonsense that we have at the moment. And ladies and gentlemen, this is your NHS. This is your system. We are losing it in droves. It is disappearing rapidly. If you don't make sure you understand what's happening so we're not fed the lies that we are day in, day out, then I'm afraid you are the architects of your own misfortune. Right. <laughs> it's impossible to defer clapping in this discussion. <laughs> Christian, can you offer some concluding thoughts, please? Well, that's a tough one. Um, may, maybe I should just start by clarifying my position. I'm not saying that there's anything magical about the private sector. I'm just talking about different feedback mechanisms. So, of course, the Volkswagen scandal happened, but look at what happened to the share of that company afterwards. It has crashed, and compare that to what happened to the people working at Mid Staffordshire afterwards. So, what, what matters is the feedback mechanism. Uh, which differs a lot between markets and state monopolies. And, yeah, I guess the, the big difference between us here is really about do you want a system that is a system in which providers are directly accountable to you in your role as consumers, or do you want a system in which accountability happens through the political process, in which uh, you have to trust politicians to make the right decisions, uh, for you, and I, I think that's a no-brainer. I'm going to make uh, two points, which, and then follow on from Christian. Um, the first was a, the community paediatrician. Um, I, I think there has been a massive expansion about the role of the doctor. I think we are now trying to be a social worker. We're now trying, you know, we have so many lists and regulations that we're meant to ask for that we've sort of moved away from actually that patient-doctor relationship. And I think that speaks to the heart of a crisis in professionalism and a crisis in what it is to be a doctor. I think we don't, we don't quite know anymore. And it's because part of it comes from the profession itself. Part of it comes from government incentives, which say that your role is no longer to make people better, but to make people better people, more environmental, they must smoke less, cycle more, they must care about domestic violence. You know, w there's been a massive expansion on what it is to be a doctor. The second point was is about the weekend mortality rates, and, and, and it comes back to the junior doctor and the, who's, who quoted the Conservative Minister. I think we need to have an honest discussion about the NHS and we need to accept failings. After Mid Staffordshire and after Morecambe Bay, there was... Uh, in some sectors, a knee-jerk reaction which said that, you know, but look at the rest of the NHS. The rest of the NHS is good. This is just a rotten apple um, barrel. I think we need to recognise that there are aspects of the NHS that are good, but there are aspects of the NHS that are bad. And I think just conflating any criticism of the NHS as, a, as tantamount to accepting privatisation is wrong. And that's what I would argue. The kind of... The intricacies of which provide a private-public 
is neither here nor there in a sense. It's about what we want from our healthcare system, what it is to have a universal healthcare system, and whether or not the national health system as it stands at the moment is what we want and what we need for the future. Mike, what are your concluding thoughts? Well, one is a recollection. When I was a junior hospital doctor, I remember this feeling on a Friday evening. We used to say, thank God it's Friday and there'd be no consultants around for 48 hours. And we used to think the patients would be much better off as a result of that, you know, because <laughs> the, 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 the consultants were all old and out of touch and the, the hospitals are basically run by the junior doctors. And uh, I'm rather shocked by these statistics that have uh, recently come forward. And I'm rather sceptical of them, actually, that uh, suggest that there's a higher mortality at weekends. Um, certainly uh, didn't correspond to my experience. I think that the you know we, we're stuck. It's a it's a you know, these problems are very difficult. Obviously, we on the one hand we've got this bureaucratic beer moth of the NHS, which is an enormous inefficient. You know, uh, as I think it's undermanaged rather than overmanaged. Actually, and, and the managers are inadequate quality. I think yeah. it's always a very easy target to, 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 to blame the managers. Um, I think that the other thing, that one thing that's worth remembering about the private sector is that the, the only reason health was nationalised in Britain in the first place was because of the failure of the private sector. That's what happened in the, 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 in the 30s. The private provision in hospitals and in the just basically collapsed under the pressure of the Second World War, and it had to be nationalised in order to provide any kind of decent service. So that was the historical experience. And I, uh, I accept many of Claire's points about the, uh, the problems that are associated with the intrusion of the private sector into the healthcare in the current form that it, that it, that it, that it is happening. That is not going to improve matters as far as the problems. It does not address the, the problems that we've got with the NHS. I think that, you know, I, 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 it may seem rather sort of curmudgeonly of me as a sort of former doctor to, to say that I think people's sympathies are probably not best expended on the medical profession in this debate. The medical profession has done all right about out of the NHS. The medical profession is reasonably well paid. It enjoys a high level of public esteem. And, you know, the junior hospital doctors are true, frankly, having a bit of a hard time. They've shifted. They are a bit demoralised. They'll, you know, de de deferred gratification. They'll How's all come out of it in going, the end. Mike? How's <laughs> retirement going? I'm not in a big hurry to get back to it, I have to tell you. So, you know... But the people that I would express sympathy with, not with the doctors, it's the poor patients who are the suffering from the, 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 uh, the, all these, uh, these problems. But above all, to return to my original point, they're suffering above all from the inflation of health and the obsessive uh, promotion of the, the health and well-being agenda, the whole wellness syndrome. And as the, the, the authors who pr formulated the concept of the wellness syndrome um, uh, Carl Cederstrom and Andre Spicer, they make the point, finding your way out of the wellness syndrome is not easy. Uh, too true. But the, the start of it is to stop obsessive, obsessing about, obsessively listening to our bodies, to give up on this obsession of health and well-being, and to accept at the end of the day that the morbidity of the body, shit happens, illness happens, yeah, to to and, and, and to direct our energies on the sickness of the world rather than the sickness of our own bodies. Thank you.